Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, as we continue on, I think this is week seven now in our series on the doctrines of the Christian faith. And um, we began by looking at the doctrine of the Bible, and then we looked at the doctrine of God, talking about his nature, who he is, and then uh, the doctrine of Christ, and who Jesus is in particular, and his nature. Uh, then we looked at, last week, the doctrine of man, uh, who we are, and today I want to look at where we went wrong, and that is the doctrine of sin. The doctrine of sin, as you can see at the top of your notes. Um, and uh, at the top I've written this statement, which I think is really important for us in terms of understanding our approach to this doctrine. We must understand sin in order to understand the need for salvation. If sin is denied or even minimized, the need for salvation becomes distorted or even eliminated. So in other words, it's, it's, un, it's an understanding and a thorough and correct understanding of sin that will lead us to understand why it is we need Jesus, to why is it that we need to be saved. So um, one of the problems is that many, uh, some Christian groups, many cults, uh, so-called Christian cults, uh, minimize the nature of sin so that the work of Jesus isn't nearly as important as it actually is, and that's a very dangerous path to take. Um, so we want to make sure we understand the biblical teaching of what sin is. And in order to do that, I think these three areas of sin need to be looked at. The first is the nature of sin, what is sin, the origin of sin, where did it come from, and the effects of sin, or the consequences of sin. So that's kind of just a general outline of, uh, I think, how we ought to proceed. Um, the, uh, we begin with the nature of sin. Uh, sin may be defined in the broadest sense as any lack of conformity to God's moral law or his perfect nature. Or his perfect nature. So I think that's just kind of a very broad and general way of defining uh, what we're talking about when we use the word sin. It's when we fail to measure up to God's standard, to who He is, uh, his, his perfect nature, His perfect morality. Uh, and so that concept is reflected by a number of biblical words or terms. And I don't have them all listed, but I have several listed here, which will give you an idea of just uh, how um, various uh, the ways are that you can describe this concept. Um, the terms that the biblical writers use to characterize this lack of conformity to God's will would be things like missing the mark or falling short in Romans 3, breaking or transgressing the law, rebellious or disobedient, unrighteous or evil. These are all ways that uh, sin is described. You all can take a, a copy of the notes right there on the, on the shelf. Uh, I don't have time to look at all these uh, terms for sin, but I would like to look at one. Just uh, for example, Romans 3, 23, the Apostle Paul is writing, and uh, it's a very well-known verse, and I'm sure you uh, are familiar with it. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short. Um, I can remember when I was in seminary, my Greek professor was uh, always upset about this verse and the way that it's been translated. Um, because the Greek word really does not have anything to do with falling short. It has to do with missing the mark. It has to do with not hitting uh, the goal. Uh, but not, but falling short, and the reason why I think falling short is a, is a very poor translation is this. Um, I can remember years ago, I was watching a New York Yankee baseball game. And it was a, kind of a historic game. It was many years ago. But the Yankees were, were behind like 10 to 1 in the baseball game, right? And then they started coming back. And they're coming back, and they're coming back, and finally the score is 10 to 8, and then it gets to be, in the ninth inning, 10 to 9. And there they make the third out, the game ends, and they fell just short of tying the game and sending it into extra innings. And sometimes I think when we think of sin, we can think of sin as coming so close and just falling short, and that is not the idea of sin. Sin, if you want to think of it as falling short, what I want you to think about is standing, going down to the beach, down in Seaside Heights, and taking a coin 
and trying to throw it across the ocean and hit England, you're going to fall short. That's the kind of falling short that sin is. Okay? Sin means you come nowhere near God's perfect character. So falling short can, I, I think, be a misunderstanding that we can be so good, we can come so close to God's perfect character, but we just fall short. Not true. Not true. Sin is far more corruptive than that. Sin completely annihilates our relationship with God. It creates a chasm that we could never cross. We don't come close to God's character. So uh, missing the mark is, I think, uh, just a, at least a little bit more descriptive um, and uh, less likely to be misunderstood. We completely miss uh, the standard. We don't even come close. But that's what sin is. It's a very, very serious thing. We're going we're gonna to look at that. Um, Sin is bad news, and sin occurs in a variety of forms. And I think it's important that we are aware of just um, how easy it is to sin. Um, despite the many forms of sin, there seems to be a common root to all sin, which is pride. Pride. Pride means placing one's own will, desires, or values higher than God's. In any sin, a person, in effect, says, my will takes priority over God's will. And that's really what pride is. It's kind of telling God, Lord, I know you've got a lot of good things to say, and I know you want a lot of things from me, but right now, uh, I'm just going to ignore what you have to say, and I'm going to do what I want. You know, I, that, that's placing your desires first. When you sin, when you choose to disobey or to rebel against God's will, you're basically putting your own desires first, and, I, and that's really a form of pride. And, and uh, C.S. Lewis uh, I think was right when he said, really, in the end, all sin can be boiled down to pride. That's really what we're doing, regardless of the kind or type of sin it is. It's basically telling God, uh, let's just put your will aside, and I'm going to exercise mine for a little while. And as I say, that can occur in many, many forms, and I have, have them listed here, and the Bible uh, describes all of these. The first one is that sin occurs in actions. Sin occurs in your actions. And an example of that is Exodus 20 says, you shall not steal. Very simple. You know, that's an action. That's something that you do that is wrong. God has made that very, very clear. Many things we do. And, and I think a lot of times, maybe Christians are so focused on the doing part of sin, they maybe they forget that sin can occur in, in a, a number of other forms as well. For example, uh, the second one, sin occurs in speech. Sin occurs in what we say. Jesus is talking in Matthew 12. He says, For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. By your words, by the things that you say. We must be very, very careful. And um, James talks a lot about that in his, in his, uh, in his letter, uh, about the tongue and how powerful the tongue is <coughs> and how uh, much damage a tongue can do by what it says. Sin also occurs in thought, in our thoughts. Jesus again in Matthew 5 says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Angry. Thoughts. Thoughtful. Thoughtful anger is also sin. Sin also occurs in attitudes. Attitudes. Jesus, uh, Paul writes in Romans 2, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. Stubbornness, unrepentant heart, attitudes, sinful attitudes that we have towards things. And then finally, the one that I think is really the, the one that people uh, forget about is that sin also occurs by what we neglect to do. What we actually neglect to do. If you fail to do the right thing, that, that can be sinful. You haven't done anything at all, but you should have. Well, that's sin. James uh, 4 writes, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. If anyone knows the good they ought to do but don't do it, it's sin. So when you back up and look at that, it turns out that it's pretty easy for us to sin. <laughs> you know, almost no matter what you do, where you turn, what you think about it, there's always the potential for sin every time you turn around. And uh, I think that's probably, uh, when you read the Old Testament and you read the law, right, the law that God gave Moses, it's extensive and it's, it's extremely involved 
and it's detailed. And those poor Jews, you know, there were so many rules to that law and regulations they had to follow. Every time they turned around, they were sinning, you know, it seemed. You couldn't do anything, and, and you were breaking a law of some sort. And, and I think God intended it to be that way, so that the Jews got an idea of just how um, important and significant sin is in God's eyes. It is really, really important, and it really reminds us how fallen we are, how sinful we are if we're constantly disobeying God's uh, law. Well, that law has passed out of existence. It no longer applies to us after, after Jesus has come. Um, but, nevertheless, sin now still can occur in all these forms, and it still remains a very easy thing for us to do. And uh, we just need to be aware of that so that we can take a stand against it. So, all sin is serious. Just one sin can separate you from God forever. What was, think, what was the result of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden? Well, one sin in the Garden of Eden created an eternal problem. And uh, only God could solve that problem. But that was one sin. James uh, 2 says that very thing. For whoever keeps the whole law, if you keep the whole thing, and you stumble at just one point, you're guilty of breaking all of it. Guilty of breaking all of it. So all sin is serious. The one sin is enough to render you imperfect and separated from God forever. But while all sin is serious, not all sin is equally serious. Not all sin is equally serious. And, and this is where I think uh, many, many Christians... Uh, I, don't, I think they fail to make this, this discernment. Um, there are different um, gradations, if you will, or different uh, levels of the seriousness of sin. And that's what the, the Bible clearly teaches that. Um, the law, the Old Testament law, uh, in the Old Testament law, certain offenses were deserving of greater punishment than others. Okay? Um, not every sin in the Old Testament law got the same punishment, or you had to pay the same fine. They were, they were, it varied. The more serious the sin, the greater the punishment. There was a difference in their seriousness. Um, for example, some of those sins incurred uh, the death penalty, capital punishment. Uh, others incurred corporal punishment, and yet others a fine. So there were different levels of punishment for different sins indicating some were more serious than others. And in the New Testament, John refers to a sin that leads to death and to a sin that does not lead to death, which would be less serious. That's in 1 John 5. So, um, again, you that idea that you know some sins are worse than others. Jesus referred to the sin of Judas as a greater sin. What Judas did, betraying Jesus, extremely serious sin of Judas betraying Jesus would not be as serious as you having an angry thought against somebody. But even though that's true, the angry thought that you have somebody is against, it is enough to condemn you forever. So all sin is extremely serious. There's no such thing as a, a light sin. Every single sin carries with it eternal punishment. But again, not all sin is equally serious. Jesus spoke of an eternal sin which is so great that it can never be forgiven. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They're guilty of an eternal sin, Jesus says. Um, we will come back to this idea when we talk about the Holy Spirit in a few weeks. Um, so, Because uh, a lot of believers have a question about, you know, what is that sin actually involved. And so we're going to, I'm going to hold off by going into too much detail now, but we will talk about that when we talk about the Holy Spirit in um, two weeks. Um, yes? Like, in my mind, how I think of it as sin, is like we don't become sinners because we sin. We're sinners, and that's why we sin. So it's just like the essence of, of rather than anything that we do, is this is just like being an American. No matter what you do, you're an American. No matter what you do, you're an African American, this and that. No matter what we do, even the good things we do, we don't know God, we're still sinners. Yeah. It doesn't change anything. Well, that's exactly right. And, and actually, in a few minutes, we're going to get into that in quite a bit of detail when we talk about the effects of sin. One is that our nature is simply corrupt from day one. And, and that's right. So, because we are sinners, we sin. That's what sinners do, exactly. 
Um, but yeah, hang on, we're going to go into more detail. <coughs> uh, but before we do, I want to talk about the origin of sin. Where did <coughs> sin come from? It had to come from somewhere. It must be understood that God is morally perfect, completely free from sin. All right, That is God's nature. No sin at all in God. He cannot sin, nor does he tempt anyone else to sin. The Bible is very clear about that. God does not tempt us to sin. That's Satan. That's his role. Okay. Certainly, God could not have been the author of sin. When God created the world, it was without sin. And yet, sin exists. So that's the big question. Where in the world did it come from? Even though... God did not cause sin to occur. He's not the cause of it. All right? But he has clearly allowed sin to occur. It is something that he has permitted. And I think it's important to make that distinction between causing sin and permitting it. In permitting sin to exist, God does not violate his sinless nature. All right? God remains sinless even though he's permitted sin to exist in the world. All right. Is that clear? Everybody, so God's perfect, he's allowed sin to occur, but that doesn't make him sinful. Okay, sin's down here, you know, he's there. So where did sin come from? That's the big question. Where in the world did it come from? Well, we know the Bible tells us that sin entered the sinless world through the actions of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were free to either sin or not sin, right? God gave them a choice. They could choose to eat from any tree or from the prohibited tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is what God said. That was the one and only rule, basically, in the garden. One rule. One rule. It seems like they couldn't handle it. <laughs> you know? like we got rules all over the place in society. We, we keep a lot of them for the most part. They had one rule and they couldn't, they couldn't do it. But in not... Uh, it, it, in disobeying, it was a choice that they made. It was a choice that they made. They chose to disobey. They chose to disobey. The free will that Adam was given was exercised in the wrong direction. Sin entered the world through the misuse of their God-given freedom. That would be Adam and Eve. There is no other place from which sin could have come. Now, I will say this. Um, this, is, this is an issue that not all Christians, not all theologians, for example, not all Christians agree on. There are different uh, views of the origin of sin, but this makes most sense to me. Uh, I, I just think that um, the, the blame for sin lies squarely in the lap of, uh, of us, of, hum of humanity, in this case of, of Adam and Eve. It was their choice to sin. Now, I think the Bible... Uh, supports that very thing with the following verses. James 1, 14 and 15 says this, Each person is tempted, not by God, but when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So James is indicating that it's our own evil desire that uh, leads or that uh, serves as the origin of sin. In 1 John 2.16, we read this, The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, sin, comes not from the Father, but from the world. It comes from the world. So, in the next bullet point, the blame for sin belongs to man, not God. Therefore, the blame for sin belongs to man and not God. It is man using that free will that God gave to man to make the wrong choice. Adam and Eve could have chosen to obey. In fact, they could have continued to live in the garden uh, as long as they were obedient, and to this day they could have still been in the garden, you know? There was no death, they would have lived forever, um, as long as they didn't mess up in the meantime. But um, we don't know how much time went by between the time they were created and the time they sinned. Could have been a really, really long time. Uh, could have been a billion years. I don't know, but it could have been a month. You know, well, we're just we're not told in Scripture how much time uh, has gone by. Uh, I don't know. Um, 
but but they did they did sin, and that's uh, that was the issue. So your final bullet point says that God is no less sovereign because He chose to permit man to sin. And again, sometimes theologians say, well, um, God is sovereign. <clears throat> And so, uh, therefore, that sin ultimately has to be something that God ordained or that God intended. Um, I don't think, I would not characterize sin that way at all. Um, I think we need to be really careful because I think when you do that, it's hard to avoid God becoming the author ultimately, ultimately of sin. Um, so, I think God is still sovereign. God is totally in control. And God knew that sin would occur, clearly. And God, thankfully, had a plan for us, to, to help us, uh, because as we'll see, we could not help ourselves. So God is cl still cl uh, sovereign. I am not saying that, that um, the idea of man sinning was an idea that God did not expect, or that, you know, one day uh, Adam and Eve wake up and they sin and God goes, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Man, I didn't think that was good. No, of course not. God is sovereign. He knows the future. He knows everything. He's totally in control. And in his sovereignty, he permitted man to have this choice. But like I said, because God is sovereign, he had a, had a plan, yeah. So God would have already known that Adam and Eve would end up eating the apple. Yes. Uh, so he knew that that is the part that it will end up and then they get banished. From, uh, yeah, sure. He knew it all along. And then I guess he, he probably saw all this that, you know, we, or probably even more further he could see where we are. So, then the question is, why would he keep that tree over there? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, well, that, that does, philosophers and theologians have raised that question. Um, why permit sin? Why? Um, why why uh, create a world where that's possible? Because he could have given us a new body like, yeah. at that yeah. time itself. Rather than, yeah. yeah. Now, of course, we don't, uh, the, the actual answer to that is in God's mind, and, and we can't get into his mind to know for sure, but I like how Norman Geisler, of my former professor, uh, put it when he was talking about this. He said, um, the world that God created um, and, and permitted is not the best of all possible worlds. A, in fact, a world wh where sin is possible is not the best possible world. So God did not create the best possible world, but what he created was the best way to the best possible world. So in other words, it would appear that um, ultimately God is going to fix it all. It's all going to be settled. It's all going to be made right. And having a world that's been corrected is better than having one that never needed correction, apparently. And when I say corrected, maybe I should be saying saved. Because uh, what that entails is Jesus sacrificing himself, God sacrificing himself, for us. And a world where God has sacrificed himself is apparently better than one where he never did. That's the best I can do about that, with that. Uh, but again, those are things in the mind of God that, um, you know, we'll find out someday, I think, if we ask him. Uh, so, again, just to summarize, God is no less sovereign because he chose to permit man to sin. In the supreme wisdom of God, he chose to create a world where sin was possible, fully known, knowing that man would bring sin into the world, fully knowing that he would ultimately bring, bring about the defeat of sin by providing a remedy for it. <clears throat> so, uh, Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians. How does Ephesians begin? Um, let me just uh, read to you the very uh, few, first few verses uh, in Ephesians. Um, 1, 4. <clears throat> for he, God chose us in him <clears throat> before, excuse me, <clears throat> before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Before the creation of the world. So before the creation of the world, God knew what was going to happen. And he already had a plan at that point to put into effect. So God is truly sovereign uh, in, uh, in, in who he is and in his plan to redeem us. Well, sin, while sin began in the world with Adam and Eve, on page, top of page 3, sin existed in the spiritual realms before Adam and Eve sinned. So in other words, when Adam and Eve sinned, it wasn't the first time God um, kind of encountered sin. The angel Lucifer, who is later called Satan, was the first creature to ever sin that we know of. Okay, So Satan would have sinned and fell prior in, in history to Adam and Eve sinning. 
Now, some scholars believe that Ezekiel 28, uh, 12 to 19, and Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, would be descriptions of the fall of Satan, as uh, 1 Timothy 3, 6 seems to confirm. <clears throat> Those verses <clears throat> speak of um, Satan falling. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just having a hard time with my throat this morning. I apologize. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, we can look at that very, very quickly. I'll look at the Isaiah passage just uh, very briefly. Isaiah, you can kind of get a feel that it appears, without uh, directly saying so, it would appear that Isaiah is describing um, actually the fall of Satan in these verses. Isaiah 14, uh, beginning at 12. Isaiah writes this, he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. I will make myself like God. And uh, that uh, really does, and, and of course Paul talks about the sin of Satan as being one of pride, and that seems to reflect in that. Yes? Dr. Glenn, I don't know if I, uh, I um, understand, um, were angels created beings, or were they with God all along? Well, they were created. Okay, so it says that they were, they're a little bit better than a man, right, in the Bible. Yeah, <coughs> higher, yes. Higher than a man, but it's clearly, I mean, the Bible clearly says that they uh, were created. Yes, because, um, uh, in fact, in John, it says uh, uh, all things. All things, okay. You know, so all things would, would in include everything except God. Okay. So, yes, um, clearly angels are created. Uh, the, the idea of an eternal being applies only to God. He's the only one who's eternal and was, was never created. So at some point, the angels were created, um, and it would have been before the physical world, apparently. And uh, it would seem that before the physical world, or excuse me, before the uh, sin in the physical world, Satan sinned and was cast down to earth. If this, if this is a passage, I think it is, that describes the fall of Satan. But it's kind of interesting because the sin that Satan commits is one, I will be like God. I will be like God. And as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, that is the very uh, same kind of thinking that Adam and Eve had. Satan tempts Adam and Eve that, oh, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree because then you will be like God. And that temptation to be like God, that temptation of our pride to put ourselves in God's place is one very hard to resist sometimes. Yes? Does Satan currently know his demise, or does he still think that he can be above God? I don't know what he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> but I, scripture. <laughs> yeah, if he if he's read the Bible, I you know he should be scared. Uh, but again, uh, I don't know. You know, it's a, just something we're not told. Um, yeah, because God offers always offers forgiveness. And yeah. It seems as though this wasn't a one-time banish from heaven. It's an ongoing yeah. defiance against. Yeah, I mean, you can you can come up with conjecture. Perhaps Satan thinks he'll be forgiven in the end, just like people you know get forgiven. I don't know what he thinks. I don't know what his experience has been. But um, <clears throat> at one <clears throat> at one level, you would think, as clever as he is, he's awfully stupid. <laughs> you know, because after all, he was in God's presence, and at one level, Adam and Eve never saw, you know that. They probably didn't experience God in the same way that Satan did in the heavenly realms. And, and so experiencing God in the heavenly realms, you think, would be even more reason not to sin. I don't know, you know. But, it, but we just don't know. Chris? Two things. Uh, one thing is, wasn't there a place where Jesus went and uh, one of the demons said that, you come, are you going to torment me before, um, like, the, before the time, which I think is probably referring to judgment and then... I think he told him you can go into the pig. Right, 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 right. right. Uh, so I think they probably are aware that there will be a time, I guess, when the judgment would come and they may. would get. Yeah. yeah. My second question is around. Uh, so, so you said that when when the uh, when Satan sinned, he was cast out onto earth. But if he was cast out onto earth, then how did he go back to where Adam and Eve was and tried to tempt them? Because I'm assuming 
that is probably somewhere where God stays where Adam and Eve lived. Yeah, again, the details are fuzzy, but apparently Satan is uh, is able to get an audience with God in some some way. Uh, even with Job, if you think of the thing with Job that, that he was talking about. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Uh, Chris was just asking that if, if uh, Satan was cast down to earth, then how can it be that later on he has these conversations with God, or he seems to be in God's presence? Is that that's I think what you seems to be in God's presence? Um, and uh, again, those are things that are happening in the spiritual realm. We don't know how it's possible in the non-physical world, but apparently it is for Satan to still have these conversations with God, even though he's been cast out. Um, and I don't know. I'm just you know uh, maybe uh, Satan is not allowed to dwell there, but perhaps God does give him opportunity to have conversations with him anyway. Oh, just like in the story of Job. And Job, exactly, because uh, here God and Satan has that, they have that conversation. Where it takes place, I'm, I don't know, mm. you know, God is omnipresent. I mean, uh, as sinful as we are, we have conversations with God. Sure, that's so exactly it's right. Possible. Yeah. He Exactly, uh, we have conversations with him, we're sinful. Yeah. So yeah, that's um, that's something that God God apparently... Uh, it doesn't did. say that Satan was made human. No. So he's still a spirit, so therefore... Yes, right, so uh, sorry. So these things happen in the spiritual realm, which we just, we don't have knowledge of because we're limited to uh, the physical world and uh, physical experience that, that we know. So these things uh, are happening, and that's why we need the Bible to reveal them to us because we're unable to know these things on our own. And the Bible reveals just enough, you know, we have lots of questions, uh, lots of additional questions, um, but we'll have to wait. Uh, yeah? Does the Bible say anything about Satan? Uh, sort of being, I mean, I know God's all-knowing, but does God allow him, I mean, he's, you know, it seems to be that he's aware of the lot. Yeah. That is. Yeah. So in order to tempt us, I think Satan is aware of our weaknesses. So God has allowed that, of course. Oh, sure. Because it's, sure. he's his creator. Yeah, yeah. But again, we don't know exactly how much. Some people get very superstitious. You know, there are some Christians who say, well, don't speak out loud. Um, because Satan will hear you, and then you could become vulnerable, you know, because I wouldn't get too worried about that kind of thing. Say what Satan knows, he knows. Uh, probably doesn't matter what you say or not say. Uh, the important thing is, uh, for us Christians, is that while Satan has power to influence, ultimately, uh, God, uh, Jesus, has conquered Satan and Satan's ability, and Satan's on a leash, you know, which God holds. So God is in control, and that is what we as Christians rest in, the fact that God is in control despite Satan's ability to influence. Yes, Bill? I think God doesn't reveal more to us for everything because just like Lucifer became prideful, with knowledge, we as humans Very can fast. fall into that pride. Sure. And pride is probably our worst enemy. Yeah. And, and Satan knows this. That's why he continuously creeps into our lives yep. to, to tempt our pride. Yeah. The more we know, the more we think we need less of God. Sometimes. Yeah, I think God has revealed enough, enough, so that we know who he is and we know what we need to do. But he hasn't revealed everything. Yes, well. And while God has allowed Satan to do his things, he has given us these spiritual weapons to yeah, deal with Satan point. every day. Great Prayer, point. which is sadly lacking in the church. Um, as well as the Bible, as well as, you know, yeah. what God... Well, Paul talks about the spiritual armor of God yeah, in Ephesians armor. 6. Yeah, we put on the armor, and those are the weapons that God has given us to fight Satan. So, while Satan is a formidable foe, we do not need to fear him um, that he will, uh, you know, take us away from God. That that simply is not going to happen. Yes? Um, does it say, is there... If, um, can you sign find something in the Bible that, um, okay, God knows what's going on in your mind, what's going on in your heart. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, but Satan doesn't know that. It's, un it's unclear what, how much he knows, I think. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm unaware. I mean, Satan only knows the moment you say something or do something. Uh, does it say something like that? In the Bible? No. No, and that, that's why I, th I say it's, it's unclear how much he knows and how much he knows our thoughts. I just don't know. Uh, the Bible just doesn't specify his knowledge. Um, and so I can't answer that with, with any kind of certainty. Well, let me go on. Um, uh, you're, uh, we're talking about, uh, ultimately, uh, that uh, passage I wrote talked about Satan's pride. 
And uh, so it is no accident that Satan's first attempt of Eve centered on pride, as I said. You will be like God. Um, God sovereignly uses the sins of people to bring about his own good purposes. His own good purposes. Which is kind of interesting, because sin does not mean that uh, the world has run wild and God is no longer in control, because God can use even people's sin for his own purposes. And a great example of that is with the uh, story of Joseph in the Old Testament being sold by his brothers into slavery. Remember that story? Mm -hmm. um, he sold into slavery, and that was a horrific thing for Joseph. Um, and if you remember the story, Joseph is sold into slavery as a young boy. How, how, how horrible that must have been for him. He's carted off to another country, to Egypt. And then through the miraculous working of God, uh, Joseph interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, and suddenly Joseph is out of, out of slavery, and he's now like the number two guy in all of Egypt. And that allows the Israelites, when there's a terrible famine in Israel, to come to Egypt. And when they come to Egypt, uh, there's Joseph. Now, he's many years older at this point, and his brothers come in there. And there's, at first, the brothers don't recognize you know, who he is, but he recognizes them. And uh, so he goes in uh, with them, and they're together. And then suddenly, you know, they realize who he is, and they're terrified because he's like the number two guy in all of Egypt. He wants them killed. He snaps his fingers, and they die. You know, and they, they're terrified at, at what they've done. And what does Joseph say to them? He says this in Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm many lives. Oh, the rest of that got caught off. But God intended it for good by the saving of many lives. God intended it for good for the saving of many lives. So that whole sin that the brothers committed by uh, selling Joseph into slavery, God used to save the lives of so many Israelites from famine, which never would have been possible if Joseph wasn't in that position. The, when I say God is sovereign, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. God is in control of events in the world and can use even our sin for his good purposes. It's amazing, but that is what a sovereign God can do. I was thinking of the thing what Chris was asking originally about, like, why would God put that tree there? And sometimes when we even say, like, why would God allow Satan to be here and tempt us? But I think, you know, God is a God of love, and I think the one thing is that it's love, really love, that people don't have a choice. Exactly. If God had made us all like robots, we can't sin, we can't do this, and say, well, look at these people love me. Yeah, but they can't do anything else. And I think that even you see, like, in the book of Job, Satan's accusation to God is like, well, of course Job loves you because you're protecting him, you do anything else, and God is saying, even if I take away all those blessings, even if I give these people a choice, I'm still worthy of love, and steeple people will still love yeah. me no matter what. Yeah, I mean, if we can, uh, that is uh, an excellent point, and I'm probably <coughs> negligent for not going, going as thoroughly into the free will defense of God as I did. Um, but yes, um, it's an act of love on God's part to give us free will. God is a loving God. And so it's a loving thing that we have free choice. Now, um, in order for God to have a loving relationship with us, we have to be free to, ch to choose to reject him or to accept him. Okay? Uh, if you're not free to reject God, then your love of God means nothing. Because it means you've been programmed to do it. Right? If you program your computer to say, I love you, does that mean anything? Not really, right? Because you've told it the, the same way. If we're programmed to love God and we can't do anything else, it doesn't mean a whole lot. But if you have the choice to reject God and you still say, I love you, well, now you have genuine love. Now you have real meaning in your relationship. And that's what God seeks, is a real meaningful relationship with us. But that can only come with free choice, in my opinion. And so, uh, yes, it's a loving thing. Uh, but God, knowing that, knowing that the free choice would uh, result in the wrong choice, he made a plan. He had a plan for it. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, but what are the effects of sin? Sin is a bad, bad thing. Uh, the seriousness of the effects of sin can be seen in the extreme severity of sin's consequences. The dramatic consequences of sin affect all people, and they include at least these three things. The first one is a corrupt or fallen nature. What do I mean by that? Each person is born with a corrupt or sinful nature, sometimes referred to as original sin. You hear that phrase, original sin. 
Original sin doesn't refer to anything you've done. Original sin refers to the, to the condition, the sinful condition in which you were born. Okay? Um, as I go on to say, this means that each person enters the world with a nature that leans inevitably towards sin rather than towards righteousness. That's, that's our natural bent. Because of our sinful nature, each one of us sins. Okay, so we are born this way. Um, Adam, when he sinned and he fell, right, he became a corrupt individual, sinfully corrupt. And a sinfully corrupt person can only produce sinfully corrupt babies, uh, people. All right, so it's something that uh, we inherit from Adam. The theological term total depravity is used to describe the extent of this inherited sinful nature. The extent. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that there is nothing in us that is deserving of God's favor. That's what total depravity means. That our whole being is corrupted by sin. Not just part of your being and the other part, oh, you know, that deserves God's favor. No. Sin ruins the whole thing. Sin ruins all of you. And that it's total in its effect. Okay? That's what total depravity means. Now, total depravity does not mean that everybody is as thoroughly depraved as they could possibly be, nor that everybody will indulge in every form of sin, nor that a person cannot perform acts of goodness and kindness. In other words, just because we have, we're born with a sinful nature, we can still do nice things for people. We're not going to commit every single sin there is to commit. All right? But it does mean that the corruption of sin extends to each person and every part of each person. Okay, so the corruption of sin extends to everybody and to every part of everybody. That's how thorough sin is. So that there is nothing within human beings that makes them worthy of merit in God's eyes. It's a bad place to be, but that's how we start out. That's the need for salvation. Okay, we are totally corrupt. There is nothing deserving of God's favor within us. That's one effect of sin. The other one is judicial uh, or legal guilt. 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 And the Bible, and Paul, even when he writes of sin, uses legal terms to describe the situation uh, about sin and our relationship with God. As a criminal in the judicial or legal system is guilty before a judge, each person is guilty before God for the sins that they've committed. So it's very similar to a, like a legal uh, situation. Criminals go into court all the time. They're guilty, you know, and the same way. We're guilty too. God is our judge. We stand guilty before him. On the top of page four, since Adam was a fallen creature, he could only produce fallen creatures. As I said earlier, he could only produce fallen creatures. Therefore, like him, each person from birth stands guilty, although he wasn't, when I say like him, I'm referring to the guilt. Each person from birth stands guilty before God and worthy of condemnation. Adam was in effect a representative of the entire human race. When he sinned, we sin. All right? You think about that. We weren't there. We weren't there when Adam and Eve sinned. And yet, his sin affects me. I'm born with this nature where all I can do is sin. Does that seem fair? Seems like God's not being very fair with that, does it? You know, doesn't. But there's something we always forget. If you think in those terms, there's something you are very much forgetting. Look at the next bullet point. It may not seem fair for Adam's guilt to be credited to us. Okay? We're guilty of sin because of what Adam did. After all, we were not even there when Adam sinned. But it is equally unfair for Christ's perfect righteousness to be credited to us as well. We were not even there when he was crucified. Yet we receive the perfect righteousness of Christ freely through faith. So here's the situation. You have this um, situation, and we'll talk about it more with salvation, but this idea of, of um, imputed guilt. And when I say imputed, I mean something that's credited to you. Something that's just credited to you. And uh, we get Adam's guilt credited to us. But the reverse is also true. We get the righteousness of Jesus credited to us through faith. We don't have to do anything except believe. All right? 
And that's the, that's the offer that God has. That's the solution to our problem, is that we need something to counteract the, the sin problem, and that can come through faith. And when we have faith in Jesus, then his righteousness now is credited to us, and the guilt goes away. All right? uh, again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about salvation. Um, but, uh, and that'll be next week. Uh, so uh, it cuts both ways. All right, we are guilty, but we're also righteous, not based on anything we've done. The third effect of death, or excuse me, of sin is death. Number three, death. Death, the death that follows sin has three aspects. The first is physical death. Because of sin, we physically die, and that is the separation of the body and the soul. When you die, your soul leaves you, and body doesn't work anymore. Second one B is spiritual death. Our relationship with God is severed and we become alienated from God and we fall under his condemnation. That is another effect, spiritual death. Spiritually separated from God. And the third one C is eternal death. Eternal death. Separation from God forever in misery for those who remain outside of Christ from which there will be no escape or relief. Those three effects of death uh, are from sin. We physically die, we die spiritually in our relationship with God, and we will suffer eternal separation from Him in hell if we do not uh, receive Christ as the solution for that. That's how serious sin is. It is a terrible, terrible thing. It separates us forever from God. And um, th there's no hope for anything that you can do <laughs> To, to fix that. And so next week we're going to talk about salvation. We're going to talk about what God has done to fix the problem. Because we can't. We can't do anything. Uh, before I do, let me just very quickly run through this. Um, uh, the work of rebellion. Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it was a rebellion against God. Right? God said, do this. They said, no. We're going to do it. God said, don't do this. They said, no, we're going to do it anyway. And that's just, that's simply rebellion. And um, there are different facets of rebellion, and I think it's just kind of interesting when you walk through that, the story of the fall to see them. Um, you have rebellion's question, did God really say, and this is the, the, uh, the uh, Genesis 3 verses 1 to 20, when you have the fall described, and Satan comes to Eve and says, did God really say... Did God really say? You know, questioning if God really said, did God really say you would die? Did he really say that? You know, questioning, maybe God didn't really say what he said. Rebellion's denial, verse 3. God has said, if you eat of it, you shall die. Satan said, you shall not die. That was the temptation to Eve. You're not going to die. You don't have to worry about it. You can eat that. You're not going to die at all. God wasn't telling the truth. So rebellion denies God's truth. Rebellion's appeal. Satan says, you shall be like God. That's why he doesn't want you eating it. The appeal to pride, as we talked about. Satan's temptation. Satan said, uh, rebellion's temptation. Knowing good from evil. You want to be like God? You want to know good from evil? Eat of the tree. Temptation has to do with rebellion. And rebellion's reasoning. Eve saw the fruit from the tree, and it was good for food and pleasing to the eye. She reasoned, you know what, you know, she's standing there going, you know, it looks so good, you know, so why wouldn't he want me to eat it? it? It would be good. It would be good to eat it. So rebellion reasons, justifies itself. Rebellion's uh, yielding. She took from its fruit and she ate. And ultimately in rebellion, we yield to the temptation. Rebellion's influence. She gave it also to her husband and he ate. When we sin, there's an influence on to other people. They can be influenced through our sin in the wrong direction. So what did Eve do? She gave it to her husband. She influenced him to sin. That's what rebellion does. Rebellion's concealing. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. They were ashamed of what they've done, and so now they were hiding from God. They were turning from their relationship with Jesus because of the sin. Concealing themselves from him. Rebellion's excuses. The man blamed the woman. And then he blamed God, pointing to the woman whom you gave me. And then the woman blamed the serpent. You remember how that went in the story, right? Adam says, uh, hey, God, it's not my fault. 
you know, you gave me the woman. She's the one who got me to sin. And everybody looks at her and she goes, well, what me? It was the serpent. You know, everybody's passing the blame. Making excuses. And then, of course, rebellion's consequences. Pain, obstacles, enmity with God, and death. Serious consequences of sin. Sin is a really serious thing. And once we understand how serious these are, uh, we realize there's, first of all, there's nothing we can do about it. There's literally nothing we can do about the sin problem. If we are going to uh, have a relationship with God, if we have any hope, then God has to do something. God has to act, and thankfully, He's acted in Jesus Christ. Next week, we're going to talk about the doctrine of salvation. How exactly is it that God overcame the sin problem so that we uh, can be with Him, we can have a relationship with Him, not just now, but forever? And maybe I should say not just forever, but now. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's really the emphasis, is now. That relationship starts now. Even though we're sinful, we can continue to have that. So next week, uh, come early, and uh, we will talk about salvation. Any questions, any more questions or further comments for uh, what we talked about today? The way God made two people, and one he makes to sin, and we don't forget that. Adam and Eve, okay, Eve was tested by the snake, okay, she took the apple, she loved her husband, she gave it to the husband. He also did sin, but he favored Adam, okay, but he gave the bad punishment for the ladies better punishment for the men. Well, <laughs> I think they both got, I think they both felt the consequences pretty severely of that. Um, I do feel sorry for women when it comes time to give birth. Yeah. Right? That's a pain that uh, I guess I'll never understand. I know it looks bad, I can tell you that, because I've seen it happen. <laughs> I was there, you know, and... Uh, and not only was I there, just very briefly, it's kind of funny, but when our first uh, child, Melissa, was born, uh, we were on the uh, in the maternity ward there at the JFK hospital, and Laura was in uh, just the beginning parts of labor, and uh, we're sitting in the room, and I can hear like in the room it was either the room next to us or two rooms down, this unbelievable screaming, this blood curdling yelling as this other woman was giving birth, and I, it was terrifying me, <laughs> and I was so scared that. I'm going to, you know, what would I do if that was in mine? And I was just like, oh, I'm like, Lord, this is a terrible, you know, I just, can we just, can I just be transported somewhere else, you know? And I was so, so worried because that woman was just in terrible pain. And thankfully, Laura was nothing like that. She was uh, much more quiet in the delivery, although clearly uh, in a whole lot of pain. She was ruining my focus. Yeah. Uh, Shut up. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's the kind of pain that I'm never going to understand. And, and uh, I guess I'm glad about that, but Adam didn't get off the hook too easily either, uh, because uh, he was going to have sweat and toil, and things are going to go wrong for him, and that is indeed how life is for all of us. Things just, uh, they don't, the world is broken, folks. The world does not work like God intended it to work, um, and so when bad things happen, it's a result of our sin. It's the ultimate result of our sin, any and all bad things, and uh, well, what we hold on to as believers is the hope that God is going to fix it. He's going to make it right. And that's how we're going to live forever. This is a small blip that our life here in, in the span of eternity. It's just a tiny little fraction of time. Uh, the, the illustration that I've all, uh, I like to use is that if we go into worship, and you know as wide as the room is in there, if you had a string and you uh, held that string from one wall to the other wall, the whole, the whole width of the, of the place, that if that represents eternity, our life here is about an eighth of an inch on that string, okay? That's, we have a very small amount of time compared to eternity where things are going to go wrong here. And uh, once we get past it, then we're on the whole rest of that time where things are going to be beautiful and wonderful and uh, just like God intended it. So it doesn't seem like that from our perspective now. It just seems like forever. This life is just forever sometimes when things go badly. But uh, keep that eternal perspective that when, when things go terribly wrong, that it's just... It's for a short time. Paul talks about our momentary... Paul, you know, you talk about things going wrong in that guy's life. He was constantly, constantly, um, you know, tortured and imprisoned and beaten and stoned and all these things happened to him. And he talks about our light and momentary troubles. Momentary troubles.
It's going to pass, folks, and then eternity. So hold on. Hold on to that. All right. See you next time.